Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So it has been around about a year since I left medicine for good. And so I thought it might be fun to do a kind of one year later video around the regrets that I have around that decision. So this is probably gonna be quite long. Um, so feel free to grab a cup of tea. I've got my little coffee over here. And we're gonna talk about this in kind of four main parts. Firstly, I'm gonna share a little bit of the backstory around why I quit medicine in the first place. Secondly, we'll talk about the good parts of kind of my life right now and this creator thing and like what it's like to leave medicine and leave that security of a full-time job uh, to do this more uncertain entrepreneur, creator, online chat thing. Thirdly, we're gonna talk about the bad parts, the uncertainties, the fears, the doubts, the regrets that I have around leaving medicine. And then I'm gonna end with a few kind of recommendations because people always ask me, you know, would I recommend leaving medicine for people interested in applying or people who are medical students or people who are doctors? And there's always a bit of an ethical conundrum around that. And so we'll have a little bit of fun exploring those. Of course, timestamps to all of these bits of the video are gonna be in the video description, so do feel free to skip around if you feel like it. But let's get started with the backstory. So in 2012, I joined Emmanuel College, Cambridge to study medicine for six years as a little fresher at the age of 18. And then one year later in 2013, I start my first business, SixMed, which is a business that helps people get into med school. And that's how I get my kind of entrepreneurial bug. And that's the first business I make that actually succeeds. Then 2012 to 2018, those are my six years of med school. But in 2017, in my fifth year out of six, I decided I was gonna start a YouTube channel. And so I start off making videos to teaching people about like how to do well in the BMAT and medical school interviews. And then I start vlogging life as a final year Cambridge medical student. And it's that year in my final year of med school that the channel starts to get some amount of traction. And after my first 52 videos, I get to a thousand subscribers. After my next first 90 videos, I get to 10,000 subscribers. And then in June of 2018, I graduate and I become a fully fledged doctor. I am Dr. Ali Abdal. I then stay in Cambridge where I have bought a flat with my brother and I live with my friend Molly. And for two years, she and I are living together. And in year one, I am practicing medicine, working full time as a junior doctor in Cambridge itself at Adam Brooks Hospital. And then 2019 onwards, in my second year, I'm in West Suffolk Hospital, which is like, you know, an hour away from Cambridge. And on the weekends and in the evenings and on my annual leave, I'm trying to pump out videos because this YouTube thing is fun and it's getting traction. You know, somehow things are going well on this YouTube channel. Then we come to August, 2020, which is two years in. I've completed my two foundation years of training in medicine. And at that point, I haven't yet specialized. I'm kind of thinking of applying to various different specialty trainings, thinking about applying to emergency medicine. But at that point, I take a break from medicine, intending to do a bit of traveling, take a bit of a break, and maybe check out what it's like working in Australia and getting some experience in emergency medicine. But of course, 2020 was the year of the pandemic. And so all of my travel plans completely got shot to pieces. And instead I ended up just sitting at home in Cambridge, just making more YouTube videos. And then the channel really started to take off. This was the pandemic effect. Loads of people just being online and watching YouTube videos and things just started going really well. And then a year later in 2021, mid 2021, I decided that I'm actually gonna to move to London and I decided to take the decision to most likely leave medicine for good. So in 2020, it was just a break and I'd kind of been telling myself I was gonna go back. But then 2021, I kind of, realized that actually I think I'm probably going to leave medicine for good and that was when like I haven't worked a day in clinical practice since then and I've instead been a kind of youtuber entrepreneur writing a book as well got a podcast I'm just basically doing this like internet stuff making silly videos in the on the internet rather than saving lives and at that point the reason I decided to leave medicine was essentially based on a this business just becoming phenomenally successful and just making loads of money. And so that that was what really prompted the decision of like, hang on, is the thing that I'm doing for my day job really the thing that I want to be doing if I've got options? Because previously I didn't have any options. It's like, we all need to work for a living. And when I got to the point where my YouTube channel was making more than enough money that I needed to survive, suddenly it's like, oh, hang on, what's the point of work if it's not for this money stuff? And so what I reasoned was that there's basically five main points to work or getting a job. Number one is money, obviously, but we, we can put that aside. We'll talk more about it a little bit later. Secondly, there's fun. There's the joy of work. The job is enjoyable. You know, a lot of people have that kind of thing. Thirdly, there is the idea of helping people. That the thing that I do for work allows me to help people and therefore it's a good thing. Fourthly, there's the idea that work gives you a sense of purpose and meaning in life and it gives you something to work towards and something to aspire towards. And that's very like psychologically fulfilling. And finally, work gives us a sense of social status and prestige. And there's very few professions like, you know, that are like medicine in terms of the prestige and social status that they confer to you. And it becomes very easy to tie up your identity into I'm a doctor, that kind of stuff. And at the time a year ago, I made a video similar to this one where I kind of talked through my reasoning for why I was leaving medicine based on those five factors. So factor number one, money was no longer relevant because I was making more money outside of medicine than inside of medicine. So that was no longer a reason to continue the day job. Secondly, fun. Like, yes, I enjoyed working as a doctor, but if I could choose, if I could design my life however I wanted, it would not include going to a hospital and working as a doctor. I, I really enjoy this YouTube stuff. I really enjoy the podcast stuff. I really enjoy writing. I really enjoy teaching. 
So maybe if I could design the life that I wanted, I'd probably want to teach medical students, but I didn't particularly enjoy practicing medicine. Again, if I, if I could do whatever I wanted. And I think this is an interesting question to ask yourself. It's like, when it comes to a job, like, yes, I, I enjoyed medicine. I actually enjoyed it more than most of the people that I knew. But if I ran the thought experiment where you literally gave me the option to do anything I wanted, would it include, like, would I spontaneously arrive at the decision that my ideal life involves going to the hospital every day? For some, for some of my friends, the answer is hell yes. But for me and a bunch of my other friends, the answer is probably not. There are other things I'd rather do instead. Thirdly, we have the idea of helping people. Now, I talked about this in my previous video, but essentially, you know, this one is the, was kind of the hardest one to square because it was a case of like, okay, I'm, I'm helping people in my day job. I can see the impact I'm having. And I'm, am I really gonna quit that saving of lives just so to make silly YouTube videos on the internet to become another influencer? Like who, who, who cares? Like, am I, you know, am I net negative to society by the fact that I've quit medicine to become a YouTuber or to take this YouTube thing more seriously? And to be honest, this is a thing I do continue to think about a little bit to this day. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more in the video. Then we had the whole thing around purpose and meaning. And to be honest, like most people I know, most entrepreneurs I know get a lot of purpose and meaning from the thing that they're doing there. And so to me, like, I, 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 like, I, I, feel, I feel like what I'm doing is meaningful and purposeful and stuff when I'm writing and when I'm making videos and when people email me and leave comments saying that like, oh my God, this video really helped me and it's really improved my life. And when I'm giving, I'm giving talks in real life, like keynotes and stuff. And when I meet people and they say to me, oh my God, that video you made about overcoming imposter syndrome really helped me get a raise at my job because I, I took a risk. That kind of stuff feels very purposeful and meaningful. And then the final thing, the status and the prestige, to an extent, like, I didn't want my decision of what career I do or what career I continue to do to be based on the idea of like, oh, I'm wedded to the social status and the prestige att attached to being a doctor. That to me didn't feel like I was I was living a life that I love, I was living my best life. It's if I was allowing that prestige to color significantly like what I actually wanted to do with my with my life and with my career. So those are the reasons why I quit medicine. Now we're gonna talk a little bit in more detail about some of those and I wanna to go to now to the good parts. Like what what are the better what would have been the benefits, the good things that happened in my life as a result of leaving medicine and going full time on this internet career, whatever this looks like. Alright, and so we've got three kind of main good parts about leaving medicine. There's no getting around the money aspect, uh, there's fun, and there's autonomy. So let's talk about these in turn. Now, let's start with money. And there's no getting around the fact that, you know, part of the reason why I left medicine was because this thing pays a lot better than medicine does. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, when I was working as a doctor, I was earning maybe 40,000 pounds a year. And had I kind of continued to specialize and continue to work in the UK as a fully qualified consultant, I would be earning around about 100,000 pounds a year from the age of about 34 onwards. So like six, seven years down the line after specializing, I'd be earning about 100K. Now I'm gonna be candid about the numbers on this side of the equation here. This is not to flex. This is purely because I think it's valuable for people to talk about how much money they earn and how they got there so that people who are considering alternative career paths at least have more information rather than this idea of kind of being tight-lipped about how much money you earn. And this year, you know, we haven't got all of the stats yet, but you know, it's, it's November right now. But this year we're expecting the business to probably make around two million pounds in profit. And obviously there's then corporation tax and taxes and all that kind of stuff, but two million pounds in profit. The money equation here is just completely asymmetrical. And it's just, comp it's, 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 almost, it's almost a hack. And kind of moving forward in this video, like I actually wanna put the money question aside and I wanna try and imagine, cause I had a few questions on Twitter about this. Like what if I wasn't? What if I wasn't making two million pounds a year? And instead, what if I was making 40K a year? So I kind of wanna run that thought experiment because I think that's more, almost more interesting. Like one of my options is continuing to train in medicine with a full-time job, with a very clear career path. I've been working for this for eight years and I can just continue down this path and I'll be making 50K a year for the next six years and then 100K a year thereafter. Very, very certain. And I've got an alternative path, which is a bit more risky. And in that path, let's just assume for sake of argument that I'm only making 50K in that as well. So let's say money wasn't a consideration between these two, two different paths. Would I still choose to go down the leave medicine path or is it just the case of like, oh, I just got super rich off of the back of this YouTube stuff, therefore it was an easy decision to make. And so in that hypothetical world where I'm making 50K a year from the YouTube channel and I'm also making 50K a year from my day job, like which one do I choose? Now, at this point, the way that I was kind of thinking about this, because money didn't really come into the equation very much for me, the way I was thinking about this was kind of based on three main things. The first one was the idea of asymmetrical upside, at least financially, where, you know, if you quit your job, to do something that's a bit more risky, like start a business or start a YouTube channel or write a book or, you know, all that kind of stuff, then there's more risk, but there's potentially more reward in that thing as well. Like this YouTube channel and the business around it has succeeded way beyond my wildest dreams. But if I'd been like a really, 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 really good doctor, 
like there's a capped amount of upside there because I'm working within the confines of a system that doesn't necessarily reward individual kind of individual contribution very much. Yes, there are people further down the line, doctors who do kind of have enormous financial upside because they invent a new medical device and they invent like a medical technology. And that actually was my like was my dream back in the day when I when I was going through med school, I was thinking, you know what? I enjoy medicine, I enjoy coding. I want to, you know, I want to become really good at medicine and then maybe I can invent some kind of surgical technique or surgical tool or something because I because I knew there were med tech startups, medical technology startups that did that that did that kind of thing and I was always kind of interested in entrepreneurship. But generally, like whatever you're doing, if you have like a stable thing and you have the option to quit to do something more risky, there's generally asymmetrical upside. Like the downside is capped. Worst case scenario, you just go back and get another job. Maybe you go back to the same job. Like I can always come back to medicine. To this day, I can still always come back to medicine if I want. And so leaving medicine isn't really a risk. And I know so many friends who like, you know, they're making 50, 60K a year in their day jobs. And they feel like, oh my God, if I leave my job, suddenly I'll have a gap in my resume and then no one's ever gonna hire me again. And that's like not really a thing. Like if you have a gap in your resume, if you spent a year trying to grow your own startup, trying to try to grow your own company, trying to do your own freelance thing, that probably makes you a more viable candidate for future jobs that you apply for in the future, assuming you can't just go back to your same employer. And so often, like when making decisions in life, I like to think about like, where is the asymmetry in this decision making? What's the asymmetry in quitting your job and trying to start a business? It's like, well, if it goes really well, then it goes really well. And if it doesn't, and provided you've got enough money to survive, you just get another job. And so it's really capped downside, but asymmetrical upside. So that's partly how I think about this decision, even if I wasn't making way more money in YouTube than medicine. And the second way that I was thinking about this was in terms of regret minimization. Like, what would I regret not doing? Would I regret, oh, I, I'm, I really regret taking a year out of medicine to kind of try and take my YouTube channel seriously. Would I regret that? Like 30 years from now, like 50, or 70 years from now, when I'm on my deathbed, looking back at my life, would I really be thinking, damn, I really wish I'd given another year of service to the National Health Service. Or would I be thinking, you know what? I'm really glad I took that year out. It didn't, it didn't work out, but I gave it a go. I learned so much. I put myself out there. I learned skills. I improved my ability to speak to the camera. I had more spare time. So I was able to take better care of my health. And I ended up going back to medicine, but at least I gave it a go. At least I tried. And now, I, now I'm not like dying filled with regret. So in terms of regret minimization, again, in my decision, it was obvious that like take a break from medicine and try doing your side hustle because like why not like it's just a no-brainer that I'm I'd be more likely to regret not doing that than doing it but also I think in most in most situations where you have the opportunity to take a risk where there is asymmetrical upside you it's, it's more likely that you'll regret not doing the thing if you read any of these books about the regrets that people have when they're on the deathbed the regrets generally seem to be for things they didn't do rather than for the things that they did do and one of the common regrets is I regret not taking advantage of a business opportunity. Like that also seems to be a pretty standard regret. And so in this context, I had the business opportunity I could take advantage of, but I also knew I didn't want to be filled with regret that I, I could have tried this and I didn't go for it. And I guess the final thing to say here relates to the first point that I made, which is that when you're thinking of a decision like this, the downside is generally, or the risk is generally a lot lower than you actually think. Like for example, let's say you have a 50K job and you imagine kind of taking the risk and quitting that job and doing your own thing you're kind of imagining that being a 50K risk, but it's not a 50K risk. Like, again, assuming you have enough money to be able to, and enough savings to be able to survive and to feed your family, like all of that aside, like that's obviously a given. So please don't in the comments being like, oh my God, like what if you have to support? Obviously, if you have to support a family, this whole equation completely changes. I'm thinking just in terms of my burn rate, I was, I went, I, you know, maybe spending 1500 quid a month. Therefore for me, as long as I was making at least 1500 pounds a month, which I could from doing just two locum shifts as a doctor, I was, you know, my expenses were covered. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that Quitting your job and doing your own thing is never really a 50K risk because the risk is just like, what is the next best job I could just get fairly easily? Like, let's say you're making 50K a year and you quit your job. Maybe you couldn't just go back at that level of consulting firm or wherever you're working, making 50K a year, but maybe you could get another job that pays 40K. Great. Now you've just walked into a job that, that pays 40K rather than 50K. So the risk you've taken is basically just a 10K risk, which is the difference between how much you were earning and how much you are earning in the job that you could theoretically walk into. But also it's not even that because like there's, there's a bunch of stats that show this, that one of the best ways to get a pay rise is to quit your job and then do something out of it and then apply for more jobs. Because generally when you apply for more jobs and you have experience in a previous job, you'll get a bit of a pay rise wherever you go next. And so really the downside is never as great as you think it is. And so that is kind of the money consideration. Again, if I'm trying to imagine the hypothetical future where this YouTube career was not paying 20 times more than a consultant salary would in the, in the NHS. All right, let's talk about the other good thing around kind of quitting medicine and doing this sort of career thing, which is fun. Now, again, as I said, I actually did quite enjoy my job as a doctor, but I didn't enjoy it to the point that I would look forward to going to work. 
And I would ask people, you know, do you look forward to going to work on a Monday? I would be like, well, no, but once I'm there, it's actually kind of fun. And I, I used to think that like, okay, well, yeah, fair enough. Maybe it's unfair. Maybe like no one looks forward to going to work on a Monday. But in the last you know, two years since I've been, I guess, quote, full time on this YouTube stuff, I actually have looked forward to going to work. And I have this feeling, which, you know, I'm massively grateful for, and obviously this is very privileged, but I wake up in the mornings on a weekday and I'm actually excited. Like I can't wait to finish my morning routine to get showered and changed and stuff so that I can get to, you know, at the moment I'm focusing on finishing the second draft of my book. And I just, I, I just love it. Like I, I just cannot wait to get seated on my desk or like take my laptop out and start working on this thing because it's just so fun. I feel kind of sad in the, in the sense that if I had, continued with that mindset that, oh, work's not supposed to be fun. Like you can't possibly look forward to going to work on a Monday because that's just weird. And you know, the best work can be is like not bad or like fun enough once you get there, but you actually don't look forward to it. If I had thought that that was the only way to live in a job, I might have spent, I don't know, 80,000 hours of my life, like the time that we spent at work, spend at work, potentially doing something that I actually wasn't particularly satisfied or fulfilled by, but I would have convinced myself that this is just what a job is. And now that I have that feeling of like genuinely looking forward to the thing, it's like, you know, back in the day when, when I used to do tinker with like website design, I would look forward to going home from school so that I could make websites. And it's like that capturing that feeling. When I was in medical school and building my first company, I would look forward to when lectures finished and I could go home and tinker on the website or tinker with the course materials or sort out some like automations with like Google Sheets. Like that was always the stuff that just like really fired me up. It was, I was, I would never really look forward to like, I can't wait to go into the hospital because I get to speak to patients. Like that, that wasn't really a thing for me. It was maybe a thing for some of my friends, but realistically, like it was a thing for very, very, very few people that I knew. Like most doctors that I know don't look forward to going to the hospital so that they can talk to patients. They enjoy bits of their job, but they don't like look forward to it. And so that's like, was a thing that I was really kind of on the lookout for. And so when people sometimes ask me, it's like, hey, do you regret leaving medicine? Do you regret like the enjoyment of the job? I'm always like, no, I really don't. Like I did enjoy the job, but like it's absolutely nothing compared to when I'm doing my own thing. There was one aspect that I used to miss, which was kind of uh, the colleagues. Like one of the best parts about medicine is the banter that you get with the coworkers and the other doctors and the nurses. And it is genuinely fun talking to patients, um, especially when they're nice. But now that I have my own team and I work with people in person, I tick that box of social contact at work. Uh, back in the pandemic where it was just me and Molly or me and Sheen, my housemate, that wasn't so much of a thing. But since post pandemic, obviously working with people in real life now, it's fantastic. And I just, re I really enjoy the vibes we have with the team. So I don't regret anything on that front. And yeah, it's not hundred percent roses all the time. Sometimes, you know, when it comes to filming a video, it's a sponsored video. I'm like, oh, I really don't feel like it, but okay, fine. I'll force myself to film the video. Like, obviously there are aspects of it that I feel, that I feel like are not like all sunshine and roses and stuff all the time. So this isn't me saying, oh my God, my life is absolutely perfect, everyone quit your job to become a YouTuber because there are aspects of it that do feel like work. But one of the other benefits of now having my own team around me is that I actually, like there are very few instances where I need to coerce myself to do a thing or where I have to film a video. And I kind of realized this recently that if I don't feel like filming a video, even if we have a sponsor deadline, I can just ask Angus, my general manager to email the sponsor and be like, sorry, I didn't film the video, we'll do it next week. And they're usually pretty chill with that. Cause like, yeah, whatever, no worries. This kind of brings me to my third point here as like one of the, what are the good parts, which is the idea of autonomy. Now I happen to have this book on my desk. So good they can't ignore you, but Cal Newport. It's really good about how to find a career and a job that you love. And one of the things he cites in the book is a bunch of evidence that shows that basically the most important determinant of job satisfaction is autonomy. Is when you feel like you have that sense of control over your time um, and over what you're doing and over how you're doing it. Now in medicine, like, had I stuck to it a bit longer, had I kind of become a specialist in whatever field and become a registrar and then a consultant, I would have had more autonomy. I would have had more of an ability to like actually decide what the plan is. Whereas as a junior doctor, you kind of don't have that much autonomy. You're sort of just following orders. You know, there's, there's ways of showing initiative and stuff, but broadly you don't have autonomy over what you're doing. You do have autonomy over how you're doing it. But you know, you have to turn up to work every day, like whether you feel like it or not. It's, just, it's like, it's not even a question. Like, oh, I don't feel like going to work today. That's, that's not a thing. Um, when it comes to taking taking time off, taking annual leave, like, oh, my friends are going on a holiday three weeks from now. Let me see if I can try and get time off. Nope, I can't because I'm on call that day and I can't swap with anyone and the rotor coordinator's off sick. And so like, I, like there's a lot of autonomy that gets removed from like when you have a day job. And in particular, when you're working in medicine where like, you're subject to the whims of the rota and like the, the staffing levels and stuff, because obviously the hospital needs a certain number of staff in it at all times, which maybe a corporation doesn't necessarily have. And so really one of the main parts about leaving medicine to do my own thing is the fact that I now have autonomy over my time. I can basically do what I want when I want. I can wake up whenever I want. I can like 
you know, go for lunch at whatever time, meet up with friends for coffee. Like I was in Bali last week for the last like 10 days working from there from my laptop. I have autonomy over all of these things, which I would, would have been really hard for me to have in medicine in particular. And so that's one of the other absolutely fantastic parts about it. And that's really a thing that like the, since, since leaving medicine and kind of having this kind of internet -y career, I've met a lot of people who have also quit their day job, whatever the day job was, like medicine or law or engineering or consulting or whatever, to do their own startups and, you know, run, run their own agencies, run their own businesses. And I always ask them, they're like, hey, what, do, you, do you miss anything about your previous life? And they're like, nah, not really. Like, you know, I, I have autonomy. I have autonomy in a way that I didn't have in my previous life. And that is just, until you've experienced it, it's just so hard to appreciate just how amazing it is when you can just control everything about your life and no one's like telling you what to do in the context of a job. So those are all the good parts about leaving medicine and kind of doing this career. Let's now talk about the less good stuff, which is potentially even slightly more interesting. And point number one in the sort of bad things is the idea of career anxiety. Now, the, one of the nice things about medicine is that it gives you a very clear and very certain career path. And there's like a little bit of like kind of massaging along the way, depending on what you want to do. But broadly, you know, once you get into med school, you have a job for the rest of your life. You're basically guaranteed an income for the rest of your life. And when you apply for specialty training, at least in the UK, or if you apply to residency in the US, you know where you're gonna be. You're like, all right, cool. I'm gonna be based in, you know, for example, my friend Jake, he got a really cool academic, like really competitive position in Cambridge. And he just knows for the next 10 years, I'm gonna be on this career path in Cambridge. Five years from now, I'm gonna do a PhD. That's gonna last three years. I'm gonna do another two years. Then I'm gonna be a consultant. Then I'll be earning 100 whatever K a year and life will be good. And then I can buy a house and I can get a family. And it's a very like kind of step by step -y type career path, which is super nice. Like this is one of the things I think about that I genuinely do miss about medicine. Like I've had so many more kind of existential crises around like, what am I doing with my career? What am I doing with my life since leaving medicine than I did while I was still in it? Because in a way, when you are when you are following the yellow brick road of a default path, a prescribed path, in a sense, you don't need to question it too much. But since leaving medicine and kind of going on this more pathless path, to quote terminology from my friend Paul Millard, who has a good book about this, The Pathless Path, would recommend for anyone who's thinking lost, feeling a bit lost in their career, not really sure if the path they're on makes sense. Like this is really a pathless path. There is no path. You just have to kind of make it up as you go along. And becoming comfortable with uncertainty is something that I'm still kind of struggling with a little bit. And it's something that I, I think I'm definitely getting better at over time is recognizing that, hey, it's actually okay. I don't need to worry too much about what I'm doing with my career. I can approach it with a sense of wonder and curiosity rather than a sense of like fear that, oh my God, like, will I have a job next week? And so I think definitely if I was only making the same amount of money from this that, that I was in medicine or even making less, I would be feeling this career anxiety quite a lot. I would be feeling like, oh my God, like all my friends, they're, they're in very stable jobs and maybe this business is gonna succeed and make me a millionaire, but like probably won't because realistically the chances of that are low. So like, oh, am I really doing the right thing? And I would be constantly battling with the decision of like, you know, there's a cushy job that's very certain that I could just go back into. Or do I want to continue down this uncertain path where I'm kind of making stuff up as I go along and I don't really know what my income is going to look like next month or next year or three years from now. Now, there's another big fear that's kind of related to this, which is the fear of what happens if the business just dies. You know, there's this internet influencer career thing is probably going to be fairly short lived, if I'm being honest. Like, it's almost like being an athlete where you have a few years in the limelight. It's being an athlete, but less cool. You have a few years in the limelight where you can really kind of try and do your thing. And then once, once, you're, once you're past your prime, you become a has-been, no one cares about you anymore, your views dwindle, your subscribers start to, I don't know, people start to unsubscribe, the revenue starts to fall, and you start to feel like it's the beginning of the end, and this thing has now peaked and we're now on a decline. I honestly, honestly I think about this a lot. Like, I look at my, you know, I sometimes over-obsess over about my view counts. It's a, it's a thing that, like, you know, to be honest, these days I actually don't, don't look at it at all. I have actively made the, made the choice to not look at the analytics because I don't care, uh, or I'm trying to convince myself I don't care. But oh, I, th I would think, oh, you know, back in the day, I would upload a video and it'd get 100,000 views in the first day. Now I upload a video and it only gets 70,000 views in the first day. Damn, this is the beginning of the end. It's a sign that the channel is dying. And I have to do a lot of journaling to, and like mental gymnastics to get myself out of that mode of thinking. Because this fear of like, what if the business just crumbles around me genuinely is a thing that certainly used to keep me up at night for my first several months, if not like a year and a bit after making this decision to kind of take a break from medicine. But to be honest, like one of the things I do tell myself is A, I've made enough money now, <laughs> which is in diversified investments, but like money question aside, one of the things I tell myself is that if I, if I want, I can always just go back to medicine. Like the option is always there. And I would suggest like, you know, I've, I've had this sort of conversations with a lot of people now, since people know that I've, I've left medicine is like, I have conversations with people 
at like events and stuff, be like, oh, hey, I'm thinking of quitting my job, what do I do? And it's like, there is always the option of going back. There is always the option of just getting another job. And so that's like the worst case scenario, which is a pretty good worst case scenario to have. But also the other thing that people I think underappreciate is that when you're an entrepreneur, I hate the word entrepreneur, it sounds a bit pretentious, but when you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of doing everything yourself and you're building a business and things are going well, or even if things are not going well, you're learning so many skills and those skills you can then use to do something else in the future. So if this business completely crumbled around me, let's say, I don't know, I got canceled overnight, I got completely sued, and I, let's say I lost all the money, all the followers, all the clout, everything like that, and I had to start again. At that point, would I choose to go back to medicine? And the answer is probably not. I would always have that as a backup option, which is, and I think that's a fantastic like safety net to have, but I would still probably just try and do my own thing. I've now gotten a taste for the autonomy and the kind of control I have over my life doing my own thing. I know enough about media, video editing, video production, coding, graphic design, building a business, managing a team, leading a team, like all of the skills associated with building, building a business and doing it in YouTube and my previous background in coding means that I would just be like, all right, cool. I'm gonna strike off on my own. I'm gonna try and make, make a tech startup or I'm gonna try and make some software. I'm gonna, I don't know, make another YouTube channel, but it won't have my face on it. It would just be sort of faceless animation-y type stuff. I would try a bunch of these different things. And as long as I had enough money, either in savings or coming in through that to survive, I would be trying my best to go down this entrepreneur path again, rather than thinking, you know what, I actually want to go back to medicine because I don't have a, because everything else has failed. If everything else did fail, if I decide, you know what, I've got a wife and kids now, I need, I need to support the family and we cannot, we can no longer afford to take the risk where I'm kind of dabbling with my side hustles and trying to make a business. Okay, now I have to go back to medicine because I need that regular income coming in to support my family. And if, that, if that's the position I was in, then maybe medicine would be the option. Like the way I think of it, it's really like a last resort option because of the skills that I've built up doing this stuff and the fact that this stuff has autonomy, this stuff, by this stuff, I mean doing your own thing rather than having a job. Um, so even though it feels scary and I have these worries around what if the business dies, worst case scenario, I'm just like, cool, worst case scenario, I guess I become an indie, indie web designer again and just build my own websites and see if I can make money through that sort of thing. Now, the final kind of bad part about quitting medicine and doing this career thing is this question of, am I actually being useful to the world? Because the nice thing about medicine is that, you know, if, if someone quits their job in corporate law to become a YouTuber, no one bats an eyelid, like no one cares. It's like, but if you quit your job in medicine to become a YouTuber, then like, you know, so sometimes what I tell myself is like, well, I, I, I used to do a good thing. Okay, good with a capital G. I was providing a service to society. I was being valuable to the world. And now the fact that I have a YouTube channel means that and I'm making videos on the internet and like recording podcast episodes and stuff, like that's, that's not the same as saving lives. And it's not the same as saving lives. And yeah, this is the thing I still think about. I don't think about it too hard because the way I've kind of, the way, the way I, I think about it is like, yes, saving lives one at a time as a doctor is one kind of impact, but teaching is another kind of impact. And the way I think of it is like these videos, maybe not specifically this one, but other videos that I've done are about teaching. They're about inspiring and educating people and inspiring people to kind of do their own thing or like be more productive or study harder for them, study more effectively for their exams. Similarly in the podcast, Deep Dive, which is where we get stories of inspiring people and like steps that they took to start their own businesses. Through that, I get like emails every day, emails and Instagram DMs uh, from people basically being like, oh my God, thank you so much. Your videos, your podcast, your whatever has changed my life because it has helped me get into this university I never would have got into, or it's helped me get better grades than I ever would have gotten, which has helped me land a job, or it's helped me kind of start my business and my business is not going going well, or it helped me realize that actually I, I've been miserable in my job for the last 20 years and I'm gonna quit my job and become a whatever. And I get those sorts of emails. I've even had a few emails from people saying that like, your videos have saved me from the brink of suicide because various things. And the other thing I do is that, you know, I've taken the giving what we can pledge, which is part of the effective altruism movement, um, essentially that's that I donate 10% of my salary, of my income every single year to cost-effective charities. Now, if we donate, for example, to the Against Malaria Foundation, then on average $3,000-ish saves a life, saves the life of a child. So if I can make 2 million a year <laughs> or whatever that number is and donate 10% of that to cost-effective charities, I actually probably, like, if we just look at the stats in a purely utilitarian statistical analysis, I would save more lives in a year by donating to the Against Malaria Foundation than I would in my entire career working as a doctor. Um, a chap called Gregory Lewis has done statistical analysis of this, finds that on average a doctor saves about eight lives through the course of their entire career. You know, people are always like, at this point, like, no, but you can't quantify the impact that a doctor has. Like the doctor who was nice to you in the waiting room and like really helped, held my hand through this difficult operation or really did that operation on me. You can't quantify the impact. That's like, it's just, it's just unquantifiable. To which I would say, 
Mm, I don't I don't think it is unquantifiable. I think impact can be quantified. At least this is the way I think about it. Feel free to disagree. I would love to hear in the comments. I think impact can be quantified. And if you had the option of saving one life versus saving 100 lives, unless the one life was like a close family member, you'd probably save the 100 lives. And so similarly, if you, if you had the option to be a doctor and save, I don't know, one life a year, for example, working in the UK, or going to sub-Saharan Africa and saving 100 lives per year because doctors are more needed there, I think that saving 100 lives is morally better than saving one lives than saving one life. In fact, I would say it's probably 100 times better than saving one life. But that's just kind of kind of the way I think about it. This is how I justify it to myself, at least. Feel free to disagree. I would love to hear what people what people think in the comments. Okay, so final part of this video is a few different like recommendations and questions that people have asked. Number one, would I recommend uh, medicine to people thinking of applying to medical school? To which the answer is, it depends. Like if you really want to do it, then sure, go for it. But if you're not sure, if you're like, I'm on the fence, I don't really know if I wanna do medicine, but hey, I could just do a medical degree. I probably wouldn't, wouldn't advise that. Because doing a medical degree is like, it is fun. And six years at university is more interesting than three years at university. But like, what, what are you optimizing for? Are you trying to make money? Are you trying to make money through like a side hustle or through a business or whatever? In which case, doing computer science or doing engineering and knowing how to, learning how to code and you know, through that, you can walk into a job that pays way more than medicine does. You'll have way less debt than you do as a doctor. You have way more autonomy in generally in fancy tech jobs where they want to attract people rather than working in the NHS, which is like struggling and like really struggling to retain people. Maybe if you're in the US, then yeah, residency and stuff. But like generally the hours of those are very grueling and very difficult compared to working a cushy job at Google, for example. Like if you want to make money out of the thing, medicine probably isn't the option. There used to be a kind of cohort of medical students who sort of kind of did the thing that I did, which is that, you know, I'm going to do a medical degree. And then after my medical degree, I'm going to not practice as a doctor or I'm going to quit while I'm a doctor because then I'll be able to get a job at McKinsey or a consulting firm or get a job at Google or whatever. And this used to be a thing about like five years ago, like where as a doctor, you could quit medicine and you could walk into a different kind of job because the doctors were like, oh shit, you're, you're a doctor, you're cool. Like, yes, we'll take you. These days I have friends applying to management consulting jobs as medics and they tell me that it's really not like that anymore. It's actually really hard to get in because loads of doctors, at least in the UK, are leaving medicine and thinking, I'm gonna apply to consulting. Like that's the thing that I want to do. And so the arbitrage opportunity isn't there anymore. I remember like a few years ago, um, the way I used to think about this was, hey, anything you do as a doctor is more interesting by virtue of you being a doctor. Like being a doctor who's a YouTuber is interesting. Being a doctor who becomes a chef is interesting, but it's not anymore. Like. Again, five, six, seven years ago, when it was kind of novel for doctors to have their own cooking shows or their own cookbooks or their own like Instagram pages for cooking and lifestyle healthy type stuff, that was fairly novel. Like, you know, the doctor's kitchen, food medic, these people like that who did that thing really well, it was, it was still new. These days, every medic that I see, seemingly every medic or half of medic, half medics, or half of the medics out there are trying to do a side hustle and trying to do their own thing on the side. And so being a doctor who does a thing on the side is no longer interesting. Being a doctor who has a YouTube channel, like every single medical student, <laughs> it seems, is starting YouTube channels these days. It's no longer a competitive advantage. And so if you're thinking of applying to medicine because six years later, you will have the competitive edge of being identified as a doctor when you apply to that job at McKinsey or Google, pff, there are so many more efficient ways to get those sorts of jobs and to make money rather than doing that if you have no intention of practicing medicine. The other thing to keep in mind is that like it does cost it does cost the state money to train us as doctors. Applying to, like me going to medical school has taken away a place from someone else who might have actually wanted to do clinical medicine. I didn't know, I mean, I thought I wanted to do it at the time. I changed my mind further down the line. We're gonna talk about that in just a sec. But A, you take a place from away from someone who would have would have wanted to actually be a doctor. And B, it's not free. Like, yes, like in the UK, we only, only pay 9,000 pounds a year for our university fees. It costs way more than that to train us to be doctors. And so the system, the state, the NHS, the government, public taxpayer money is funding us to get through medical school. And so if loads of people are getting through med school with the intention from day one to leave and do their own thing, that's really bad. It's like kind of profiting from the resources of the state, which depending on your view of capitalism and socialism stuff, you might be like, oh, whatever, I'm every man for himself. But I would like, you know, nowadays when, when, when like 16 and 17 year olds ask me, hey, do you recommend applying for medicine? I'm not really sure. I tell them, if you're not sure, then don't do it because like, probably a bad idea. Like, let's figure out what you actually want. Let's figure out what kind of lifestyle you want, what you're optimizing for, what are your interests. And at that point, I can maybe advise you on what kind of, what kind of degree to do, or you can figure it out. But don't just do medicine willy nilly because you think, ah, oh, yes, I got a medical degree and that makes me worth something. Because that's A, kind of bad, and B, like no longer the case. 
in terms of like the arbitrage of a medical degree. And then the next question is like, I, and I, I still speak to loads of medical students and doctors where people are saying like, you know, I'm now in med school, I'm getting through med school or I'm working as a doctor more often and I absolutely hate my job. Like, it is amazing how many doctors I speak to who just really do not like their jobs. At that point, people are like, you know, do you recommend that I quit medicine and kind of do, do a YouTube channel or like do a business and stuff? And then I'm like, okay, this is a, this is a huge, like, this is a huge decision. A big part of that decision is, okay, like, let's start philosophically. Philosophically, I think once you're at the point where maybe you've done six years of med school and you're now working as a doctor and you realize that you actually don't enjoy it, then I don't think there's anything wrong with changing your mind. A, we've got the sunk cost fallacy. Yes, you've sunk six years into med school. Yes, the system has funded you for however many tens of thousands of pounds, if not hundreds of thousands. But if you fundamentally hate being a doctor, we probably don't want doctors in the system who are freaking hate being doctors. We'd probably rather have doctors in the system for whom like their heart sings when they're doing medicine and, and all that kind of stuff. And also, you know, I think just generally, I am a fan of individual liberties and you shouldn't force yourself to do a thing just because you decided at age 16 that you wanted to do the thing. I decided at age 16, I wanted to do medicine. I was pretty set on continuing in medicine for like most of my medical career until I realized, hang on, I now have this extra option and maybe I don't want to do it anymore. And I think that's okay. Like, yes, it's not ideal. It's not ideal that the state has wasted, wasted however much money funding me to be a doctor and then I've not practiced in clinical medicine. But I am not going to sacrifice my own life, my own kind of career happiness and fulfillment for the sake of, hey, the government has given me, given me, has put some amount of money into my education. Therefore, I feel compelled to continue this thing which I decided to do 10 years ago, but I don't enjoy anymore. So I think it's totally fine to change your mind. It's just like, you know, depending on if you're making the decision before getting in, before the sunk cost has already been spent versus afterwards, kind of the moral equation is maybe a little bit different and you do, and you do want to think about it a little bit harder. So philosophically speaking, it's totally okay to change your mind. Like my general advice to people is don't feel like you have to continue doing a thing that you hate because you committed to doing it 10 years ago. Like that's just dumb. Like, you know, it's your life. It's your, it's your, it's your responsibility to make decisions with your life that help you build a life that you love. And if building a life you love means that not doing this thing that you freaking hate as your day job, then don't do the thing you hate as your day job because you're a, I don't know, for the sake of, for the sake of the state, or for the, because the government has given me some amount of money in the past. But let's talk about it practically speaking. Practically speaking, it's really hard to quit your job and just do it do another thing because you need to make money. Like we all need to make money to survive. And so, you know, when people are like, oh, you know, I want to quit my job and start, start a startup. I was like, no, no, why? Like, A, do you just have loads of money spent, like loads of savings to be able to do that? And if you have loads of savings to be able to do that, if you're like, yeah, I can, I've got like a year's worth of savings, a year's worth of living expenses, I can quit my job and do my thing for a year. And if it doesn't work, I'll just get another job. Then great, that's fine. Like you've got some amount of runway. But if you're like, I'm gonna quit my job and start doing a thing and it's gonna start making money from day one, that's really hard to do. And generally what I would try and, uh, generally what I advise people is get to a point with side hustles where the income from your side hustles is at least funding your expenses and then worry about like, okay, should I quit my job? In medicine, it's actually fairly easy to do this because what you can do is you can work part-time as a locum. So, you know, I knew people who were working like three days a month and making a thousand pounds every time they worked, every day they worked. So they were making 3000 pounds a month by just working for three days in the month. Great, now you've got the rest of the 27 days to do your side hustle or do whatever you want. Spend time with your friends and family. I knew a guy who would just do these three days a month because he just loved hanging out in nature and spending time with his fiance. And he was like, yeah, I'm just gonna do this indefinitely because I don't need more than 3K a month to survive. And as long as I can just work and I want to just work the minimum amount of days possible to get to that point. Fair play to you if that's how you want to, want to live life. But generally we do need some kind of economic engine. And so willy nilly, I'm just gonna quit my job and do my side hustle. Probably not what I'd recommend. I'd recommend trying to get to a point where at least your living expenses are covered for at least a few months before trying to make that particular leap. Now, final thing I want to talk about is a question that I had uh, on Twitter when I was mentioning I was doing this video, which is, do you recommend uh, being a creator as a career path? Because it seems like loads of kids are wanting to be creators when they leave school. To which my answer is hell no. Like, it's really hard to succeed as a creator in this modern world <laughs> that we live in, where everyone is also trying to do that. Like in a world where everyone is trying to be a YouTuber or like loads of people are trying to be YouTubers, it's really hard to succeed as a YouTuber. And generally the people that succeed are not the ones that are career YouTubers. There's a few of those, but they're pretty rare. It's the ones who have done something interesting and then do a YouTube channel second. So if you have like a background in like medicine, for example, and then you make a YouTube channel teaching other people medicine, that is, that's got, that's got some kind of potential to become a side hustle. If let's say you're really good at coding and, or building businesses and then you make videos teaching people how to build businesses, then that's potentially interesting. If you have a, if you kind of work 10 years in video production and then you kind of go to YouTube, like some people have done with that background, that could potentially be interesting. But just deciding I'm going to be a YouTuber and then trying to vlog your life or whatever kids try and do these days, it's not something I'd recommend. It's like people who are trying to get into streaming. 
There's like 6 million people a month try and stream, of which like 0.01% will ever make any money on the platform. Like the odds are so stacked against you in that sense that I would not recommend it as a full-time career path from day one, but I would recommend it as something to try out once you already have a way of making money. Like we all, we all need money to survive. We all need a way of making money. And being a creator to me is not a reliable way of making money. It's a way that might be interesting further down the line once you've got your basics taken care of. Oh, we have a good question from Alice Gur who says, anything you would say or advise to students currently studying medicine who may or may not have looked up to you in the past and currently? If we think kind of macroscopically, I'm gonna do a bit of opining here. I think oh, I would love to live in a world where everyone is living a life that they love, where the thing that everyone is doing for work is a thing that makes their heart sink, that makes their spirit come alive when they're doing the thing. For me, my spirit comes alive when I'm teaching. For me, my spirit comes alive when I'm writing and I'm in the flow state and doing research and stuff and you know when I'm doing keynotes and things like that. I really enjoy doing that kind of stuff. For me, my spirit comes alive when I'm tinkering with websites and building tech products and stuff on the internet. For me, my spirit did not come alive when I was working as med in medicine. It would when I had a medical student with me. I used to really enjoy teaching medical students and like taking them around to the wards and that kind of stuff. I used to do physiology supervisions. That was super fun. I loved all of that kind of stuff. But my spirit didn't come alive when, when I was working when I was doing ward rounds, when I was kind of taking histories, doing examinations, doing the stuff that a doctor does. You've made the decision now to do medicine. You're in, you're in the system and that's fine. Like, you know, it's a good place to be, fairly prestigious career path, etc., etc. And if you do find that your spirit comes alive from doing medicine, then that's fantastic. More power to you. You have picked the right career for you and you have found something that's a perfect match. You're winning. Winning the game of life. You're super happy. Great. But if you find, as a lot of people do, when you start working as a doctor that, mm, this is not this does not make my spirit come alive. Now at, at that point, you're in an interesting position because you could continue in medicine and A, you could hope that as you become more senior and more specialized and stuff that your spirit will start to come alive as you go down a specialty you want to do. Again, that's a very reasonable option. I know a lot of people who didn't enjoy the foundation years and then who once they became registrars in dermatology or emergency medicine or like gastro or whatever specialty they wanted to do, suddenly they started enjoying it because now they have autonomy, they have a bit more mastery, they have a bit more purpose, they're doing a thing they enjoy and now medicine starts to be fun. And in a way, people do say, hey, it's unfair to write off medicine just because you didn't enjoy your foundation years. To which I say, fair enough. There is a chance that maybe further down the line, you will actually, it'll make your spirit come alive. But what I would say is like, try and try and gather data about this. Like speak to people who are in the specialties that you think you want to do and see, are they having a great time? Most dermatologists that I know for the record are having a great time. Most anesthetists I've spoken to are having a great time. They just love their lives. Most, most doctors who work part-time, like two or three days a week, that I've spoken to in the last several years seem to be enjoying their jobs. Very few other doctors, at least at least from my data gathering, seem to enjoy their jobs. But like, try this out for yourself. Like, run like if you were treating this as a, as a hypothesis, I don't enjoy medicine right now, but maybe I will X years from now. Speak to people who are your age plus X and see how they feel about it and see if that's a valid assumption to make. So that's one, one possible option once you're in that position. The other option when you're in that position is if you have an exit plan. So let's say hypothetically, you, while you were in med school, you taught yourself how to code and you built a couple of websites and you're like, oh shit, like med, med tech startups are hiring me to do graphic design for them for a hundred pounds an hour. This was the position I was in. I was being hired by med tech startups to do user interface design for a hundred pounds an hour. At that point, I have an exit plan out of medicine because then I'm thinking, okay, if I really don't enjoy my job in medicine, I could just leave and I could just work, I don't know, I, I could just become a user interface web designer for medical tech companies. And now I have another job. I have an exit plan to get out of medicine to then be able to explore other career paths. If you have a YouTube channel that's profitable and you're a doctor and you don't like your job, you can leave your job and then continue doing the YouTube channel thing, at least for a while and until you figure out your next move. But essentially all of that, like having that exit strategy requires you to have built some amount of potential while you were in med school by building skills on the side outside of just being a doctor. Obviously there's nothing wrong with being a doctor. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But like the skill set of being a doctor does not directly lend itself to other potential jobs. It kind of does. You could potentially become a project manager or something and absolutely it's worth exploring other career options. And still to this day, if you're a doctor and you leave medicine and you apply for other kind of jobs, you know, there's, there's loads of jobs that will take you, product management and like consulting and a few other things. It'll, it'll, it'll be competitive, but they will take you because the skills you learn as a doctor are somewhat transferable. But if you have more tangible skills, let's say you were making loads of videos and stuff while you were while you were in, in, in university and you know how to edit videos. Great, video editing is like a really like, you know, in demand role these days, provided you're good at the thing because every company is trying to make content. So now you can get another job. Like it gives you options. You have some level of optionality. The sad situation that I see is when someone has gone through med school thinking, I'm gonna be a doctor and it's gonna be great. And then they get to being a doctor and they're like, ah, oh, damn, this is really not what I thought it would be. But they don't have any other, any other options. You know, you've got to make money, you've got to feed yourself and your family, whatever that might look like. And if medicine is your only option to make money, 
then that is that l takes you to a place where now the reason you're doing it is because you have to rather than because you want to. And I would personally would rather be treated by a doctor who feels they want to do medicine rather than they have to do medicine. But even that aside, I just think, you know, given that you're at work for most of your life, it's a real shame if the job that you're doing is not something you actually want to be doing and something that you sort of feel indentured into because you have no other options. So my advice for medical students and almost anyone listening to this is that you create more options for yourself when you have skills, especially if those skills are in demand. And it is worth building those skills up in a dream world, you would still continue to do medicine because you enjoy your job. Fantastic, amazing. But if you don't, it's useful to have some level of optionality where you then have the option to leave it and try something else. Because to be honest, most of us, when we applied to med school, it was a decision we took when we were 16 years old, at least in the UK. In the US, it's slightly different. In the UK, you kind of make the decision at like 16, if you're gonna go for medicine and you start doing the work experience and the exams and all that kind of stuff. And the person you were at 16 is probably very different to the person you are now. And it's a real shame if you your life ends up being wedded to a decision you made when you were 16. Because maybe 10 years later, when you're 26 and you've worked two years as a doctor like I did, you realize, you know what, 16 year old me didn't have it all figured out. I kind of wish I had another option. And I'm very grateful that I did have the exit strategy of the YouTube channel to be able to fall back on. But for people who don't have that, you know, it's not like all hope is lost and suddenly you're indentured into slavery forever or anything like that. It is that, hey, if you wanna, we, we all need money to survive. Money is an exchange of value. If you have valuable skills, then you can make money doing do, using those valuable skills. And the ways to learn those valuable skills are outside of your day job because you don't learn those sort of skills in medicine. It's also worth exploring what other potential careers might be out there. Like, you know, consulting and like banking and stuff are the obvious ones, but there's loads of jobs out there. Like if you just look at any jobs board, go to any careers fair, you will see just how many different options there are. At this point, I know medics who have left medicine to one is a hedge fund manager at like a fancy hedge fund. A bunch have gone into consulting, a bunch have started their own companies, a bunch are working in like a uh, pharmaceutical industry. One of them has gone into research, like biomechanical research, bio biomedical research. A few are actually YouTubers. Like there's, there's, there are options out there. And the tragic thing that I sometimes see is where, in a way, at least in the UK, and this might just be my experience, but there's a bit of an attitude among some medics that's like, oh, fairly like defeatist. It's like, oh, you know, I've been like, the only thing I can do is medicine. Like I have no other options in life. All I can do is medicine and I don't enjoy my job and I'm kind of screwed. And that's not true. Like there are always options out there. There are so many jobs out there that will pay just as much, if not more than medicine does, or even slightly less than medicine does. But hey, if you're taking a bit of a pay cut and you can still survive and you're enjoying your job, isn't that a pay cut worth taking? Especially with the advent of the internet, there are so many ways to make money on the internet, like side hustle ideas and stuff. There are so many options out there. And I think it's really sad when medics convince themselves that they can't do anything else other than medicine. And they can't learn anything else other than medicine. You can't teach an old dog new tricks or any, any of that kind of stuff. Like whatever age you are, if, you, if you've gotten to the end, end of this video, hopefully you vibe with some of the stuff that I'm saying, you can teach yourself skills. And the skills give you optionality and optionality lets you unlock this idea of building a life that you love. Because yeah, we don't want to be in a place where the thing that you're doing for your, for your day job is a thing that ultimately you freaking hate. And that is a position that a lot of, well, I wouldn't say a lot of, like uh, qu quite, a, quite a few doctors that I know are in that position. So that would be my advice to students who are currently studying medicine. Build skills. Those skills will help you in medicine because they will synergize with your medical career to do interesting things. Let's say you want to start a med tech startup or you want to do... Um, like the, the, there's so much stuff within medicine itself that benefits from additional skills, but those additional skills also give you optionality. So that is that is my... That's me over and done with for this video. I have no idea how long this is going to be. This is super, super long. But if you watch this far, I would love for you to leave a clover emoji in the comments. That would be interesting. And if you haven't seen my video from a year ago, where I kind of talked about the decision to leave medicine while I was still fresh, check out that video over there. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you hopefully in the next video. Bye-bye.